Oh my, we do serve a great God, don't we? Children are bent toward rebellion. You don't have to teach them how to rebel. You don't have to send them to a class to be taught how to rebel. Rebellion comes quite naturally to children. Now you bring into the mix a passive father. A father who is absent. A father that is maybe there physically but he's not involved. And you have the story of Joseph. Today I want to bring, uh, start a series of messages on the life of Joseph. I desperately have searched the scriptures to find the perfect family and to bring a series of messages on the perfect family. This book does not contain that story. Did you know that? Every family that is mentioned in the Bible had their issues. We have our issues. But God has a word for us. Look with me in the book of Genesis chapter 37. The book of Genesis chapter 37. And uh, for the next several weeks we'll be in the book of Genesis looking at the life of Joseph. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak uh, speak peaceably unto him. Father, we pray your blessings on the preaching of the word today. We depend upon you for divine enablement. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts. We would receive your word. And today, Father, strengthen uh, our families of our church. We pray, God, that we would seek a family life that honors you. We pray for those who are in need of salvation. May they come to repent and believe on Christ today. In His name we pray. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. It is somewhat interesting to me that a total of one-fourth of the book of Genesis is dedicated to the life of Joseph. You look at the patriarchs, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now the prominent character of the book of Genesis is Joseph. And one-fourth of the book is dedicated to the life of Joseph. I wonder why that is. Well, I think number one, there it is because of the connectional relationship from the life of Joseph. The children of Israel will go into the land of bondage down in Egypt and it serves to link Genesis and Exodus together. Because we read about Joseph in Genesis, but we read about Joseph uh, in the opening of the book of Exodus. But I think there's another reason, and that is that it is practical. The life of Joseph is very practical, and it is practical in this regard. It teaches us that you can live for God no matter what culture you're living in. You can live for God no matter how sinful and secular the environment may be. Can I tell you this morning that our culture disregarding God, that our, our cities, our governments, our schools may try to force God out of their curriculum, but we still have a responsibility to live for God. Whatever your circumstance in life, whatever your situation, you can live for God. This world has never been a playground for Christians. 
It has never been in a place that, that we could say, well, you know, here's an easy place to live the Christian life. No, no, the life of Joseph teaches us that it has never been easy to live for the Lord. But there's also a third reason. Not only is it connectional, connectional and is it practical, but it is also spiritual. There is no man in all of the Old Testament who is more like Jesus Christ than Joseph. When you look at the life of Joseph, you see Jesus Christ. When Joseph forgives his brother, it reminds you of what the Lord said when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see that in the life of Joseph. So you see in the life of Joseph, Jesus. You see in the life of Joseph that you can live for God no matter where you are. Now I think one of the key verses in the life of Joseph is found in verse 19. Look at it in chapter 37 and verse 19. Joseph is referred to as the dreamer. The dreamer. He was a man that experienced dreams. That those dreams impacted his life. When he is referred to as a dreamer, it could be a complaint or it could be a compliment. It could be a, an accusation or it could be an accolade, a dreamer. I want you to see in our text in this 37th chapter three truths about Joseph and the first one I want you to see is his family. When you look at the life of Joseph, I think you can honestly say that, that here is a young man that had good days and he had bad days. There were days when he was righteous and there were days when he was unrighteous. There were days when Joseph got it right, days when Joseph got it wrong. And I have just described our lives, haven't I? We too sometimes get it right, but we also get it wrong. We too sometimes live righteous lives, but we also bring reproach to the name of Christ. There, there is a similarity in the life of Joseph and in our own lives. But, but here's what I want you to see. He lived in, in a secular, godless society. His family was in turmoil. At this juncture in the life of Joseph, he is 17 years old, and as a teenager, Joseph is overwhelmed with loneliness. Loneliness has paralyzed his life. His mama died. And now Joseph is grief stricken. And now Joseph is overwhelmed with this sense of loneliness. But to make matters even worse, he has brothers who literally hate and despise the ground that he walks on. If matters could be taken, uh, could be made any worse, his dad has showed favoritism to him. Note, notice, first of all, something about the character of Joseph in verse 2. The Bible says that Joseph, the end of it, says that Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now let me tell you, first of all, that Joseph was not a tattletale. His brothers thought he was a tattletale but I'm going to tell you there's a difference between a tattletale and somebody that's just telling the truth <laughs> and, and Joseph was just telling the truth my brother was the tattletale I just told the truth <laughs> that's the difference to help you give a frame, get a frame of reference there. Joseph was not a tattletale. And, and, and you can imagine uh, the, the thoughts and the feelings and the attitude and the ideas the brothers had about Joseph. Uh, uh, every time we do something, Joseph runs to dad and tattles on us. Do you think Joseph ever faced temptation? He's the, he's the baby. And his older brothers probably said to him, Joseph, don't be a sissy. Drink this. Take a puff of that. Everybody is doing it. Let me tell you something about the character of Joseph. Joseph had the courage of convictions. 
Parents cannot spend too much time. They cannot expend too much uh, energy. They, They cannot be too involved in the lives of their kids and instilling in them godly biblical principles because in the hour of temptation they will need the courage of convictions to say no to Satan, to say no to their own fleshly desires and to say no to everything that is going on in their world. If you wait till they are 17 years old, you have waited too late. Here is Joseph and he has godly convictions, but I want you to see the partiality that was shown to him. Notice in verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Let me tell you this, partiality is never going to bode well in your family. You can show favoritism to your children. You can can put one of them on a pedestal above the others. And it will never bode well for your family. Now the Bible says that Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. I, I think there are a couple of things going on. Rachel was Joseph's mother. And Rachel was Jacob's Most loved wife. She was the love of his life. And now she gives him a child, Joseph. Rachel dies. It is easy to imagine how that the love that was in the heart of of Jacob was transferred upon her son. It's easy to see that. But it also says in our text that He was the son of his old age. And it's not uncommon, is it, for that that son of of, of your old age to become the favorite. And so there is favoritism there. And, and, And here's the thing about it. Jacob should have known because Jacob was raised in a home where favoritism was shown you remember you remember Jacob and Esau and how that that Jacob's mother favored him and and Esau's father favored him and it tore their family apart and here is Jacob doing the exact same thing but the Bible also says that he made him you see it in verse 3 a coat of many colors One translation says that it was a richly ornamented robe. The Hebrew word uh, conveys the idea of wrist or ankles. The uniqueness of this coat was not the fact that it was many colored. The uniqueness of this coat was that it had sleeves and it went down to the ankles. In that day, most of the men, especially the shepherds, They wore sleeveless tunics, but not this one. This one has sleeves. This one is not just a waist tunic. It goes all the way to the ground. And he gives it to Joseph. You say, well, what's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal. Whoever wore that coat was designated as the leader of the clan when Jacob dies. So Jacob foolishly, Jacob selfishly, throws all of this in the face of all of the other sons that that when I die, there's your leader. And it is Joseph. It is not the eldest. It is not the, the next to the oldest son. It is Joseph. And it creates this um, um, turmoil in the family. But I want you to see how they responded in verse 4. And his brethren saw that their father loved them more than all his brethren. By the way, kids are probably smarter than you give them credit for. Kids pick up on things that that you may think, well, uh, you know, it's just a small thing. It won't matter. It may not matter to you, but it probably matters to your children. And the Bible says they, that, that they, they saw that he loved his, uh, him above the brethren. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. I want you to get this scene. Here's the family. You have, a, you have a father that is really not involved. He is passive. He doesn't want confrontation. He doesn't want to stand for any convictions at all. That's the problem in America. We have a generation of men who are non-confrontational. I'm not talking 
talking about being argumentative. I'm not talking about causing trouble. I'm just merely saying that the men in America ought to stand up for godly convictions. And he's showing favoritism. And now the brothers have hatred in their heart. They understand the code of many colors. They understand the symbolism of it, the significance of this coat of many colors. And the brothers are full of hatred. But I want to just say this about the brothers. They're a mean lot. I mean, they're bad to the bone. But in all due respect, they were raised under the old Jacob. They were raised before Jacob had his encounter with the Lord at Bethel. If I might say it like this, they were raised under Jacob before Jacob experienced the grace of God, the love of God, and how God had changed him from a trickster to the prince of God. Joseph was raised under the new, the, 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 the new Jacob. He knew that his dad knew the Lord You know, it's a sad thing, and I can't spend too much time on this, but some parents lose their children before they ever sell out to Jesus. I'm thinking about a man that made a tremendous impact in my life. He had been an alcoholic, wasted his life, abusive to his wife and his children. And about 50 years old, He came to Christ, and Christ changed his life, sobered him up, made him a godly man and a tremendous Bible student and Bible teacher. But by then, his kids were raised and out of the house, and all they had were bitter memories of a drunken father. All they had were memories of an abusive father. And I have seen time and time again This man pour his heart out to God with many, many tears, service after service, praying for the salvation of his kids. He waited too late to give his heart to Christ in a way that he can meaningfully impact his children. Let me say to you this morning, don't wait too late to give your heart to Christ. Do it while you're young. Do it while you can use that to influence your children for God. Some of you this morning are saved, but you're not sold out for God. Your heart is divided between God and the world. Your heart is divided between pleasure and God. Your heart is divided between money and God. It is divided between popularity and God. Today, sell out for God. Use your influence over your family for God. Don't wait until it's too late. Have this testimony among your children that he loved God and feared God and walked in the ways of God all his life. That's his family. It's a family in turmoil. It's a family in chaos. But I want you to see his future. Uh, uh, Joseph was a dreamer. And it's not wrong for people to have a dream. One day Joseph is out there and he has a dream. And it is is a dream of sheaves. And and it it is representative of his brothers. How that one day they will bow down to him. It is a dream that involves stars. That speaks of the fact that Joseph will be a ruler. He will have power. He will rule over his brothers. So he has this dream. The brothers are going to bow down to him. He has this dream that he's going to rule over his brothers. And you can imagine what that does to the brothers. By the way, let me just say this. That in that day, dreaming dreams was a way that God would speak to people. Today, God's primary means of speaking to us is through the Word of God. God was revealing to Joseph his will. 
God was revealing to Joseph the plan that he had for his life. And, and, and he, he was letting him know that this is my will. Can I say to you this morning that life's greatest adventure, the greatest pursuit that you will ever have in life is to discover, to discern, to know what God's will is for your life. Find the will of God. Follow the will of God. Fulfill the will of God. Your life will never have purpose. It will never be honored to God until you know this is God's will for me. Find it. Follow it. Pursue it. Fulfill it in your life. There is no greater adventure in all of life, in all of the earth, than pursuing the will of God. Can I tell you where it starts? Where this finding and fulfilling the will of God starts It starts with obeying what you already know to be God's will for you. See, we don't get the totality of the picture. God paints it a stroke at a time. And when we start obeying what we already know, then God starts filling in the pieces. God starts completing the puzzle. If you're waiting for the completed puzzle on the front end, let me tell you it's not going to happen. You have to obey what you already know. But now there's a third thing. There, there's his family. They're in a mess. Turmoil, tension, problems. There, there's his future. God has a plan, a glorious, wonderful plan for his life. But I want you to see the last thing, and that is, that is his fate. Drop down to verse 12, if you will. In verse 12, the Bible says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. You see, here's what happened. Here's what happened. Joseph has these dreams that hit the sheaves, his brothers are going to bow down to him. He's going to rule over his brothers. And then the brothers go to feed the flocks. And one day the father says, go find your brothers. And he goes and he gets lost. Now it's interesting to me that it says in this narrative that a certain man found Joseph. He's lost. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know where his brothers are. But the Bible says a nameless, faceless man, a certain man found him. Let me just pause long enough to remind you of this. God will put people in your life to give you direction and you would do well to slow down long enough to hear what they have to say. That person may not even be somebody you like. That person that God puts in your life to help guide you and show you direction and to find the will of God. You may wonder, well, what? I don't even know how I met them. How did they get in my life? Could it be that God put them there? Could it be that God has put somebody in your life and they're there now and they're there for a reason, for a purpose, and that is to propel you along in finding and doing the will of God. Well, look at verse 18 of this chapter. The Bible says, And when they saw him, that is, his brother saw Joseph afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. I can hear the conversation now. I can hear these brothers as they they gather around and they see uh, a speck in the distance and somebody says, you know what, I don't know who that is, but they look like a whole lot like Joseph. And then the talk begins. Well. Daddy's pet is coming to check on us so he can go back and tattle on us. Here comes that old dreamer. Y'all remember the dream that we're going to bow down to him? Boy, that'll be the day, won't it? Tell you what, let's get rid of his dreams and let's get rid of him. Let's kill him. We'll just kill him and we'll be done. You see, here, here's the problem with hatred in the heart. Hatred in the heart is like a runaway train. It has no brakes. It is incapable of stopping. Today there are people in prison who never dreamed they were capable of murder. But they had hatred in their heart. And they nurtured the hatred until finally that little seed of hatred has become a full-blown flower of murder. 
There is hatred in the heart. Look at verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. His coat of many colors that was on him, they took him and cast him into a pit, a pit that was empty and there was no water in it. So now they're on their brother like a pack of wild dogs. We're going to get even. This, is, this may be what our daddy thinks about you, but this is what we think about you. Then he sold into slavery. Verse 27, come now, let us, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let us not hand our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh and his brother were, brothers were content. And so they said, let's just sell him. And you know what the Bible says? After that, they callously sat down and ate a meal. It was no big deal. We can treat our flesh and blood this way. We're unmoved by it. It is really no big deal. Let me tell you something. It was a big deal. Because for 22 years, their conscience would stain. For 22 years, what they did to their brother would hound their tracks. For 22 years, it would be uppermost in their mind, this is what we did to our brother. This is how we treated him. This is what we thought about him. Friend, let me tell you, you, you cannot outrun a conscience that is condemning you. You cannot, you cannot push it down. You cannot erase it. You cannot eradicate it. There is the conscience that hounds you every step of the way. But look at verse 34. The Bible says, And Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. I have to tell you this. I cannot read that verse without thinking about what Jacob did one day. His father lay dying. He was dim of eyes, going blind. And Jacob went out and killed a kid, a goat, Fed it to his father, put the hair upon his arms so he might deceive his father. The brothers take that coat of many colors, dip it in blood, carry it to their daddy and say, we found this. The same thing Jacob had done to his dad, his sons are now doing to him. That is a bit of divine irony. And the point is this. Your chickens will come home to roost. You will reap what you sow. You cannot outrun the consequences of your sin. This morning, Maybe you are holding the shattered pieces of dreams that you've had. In your hand you can see the shattered pieces of dreams you had. And as far as you're concerned, they'll never come to pass. Does God have a word for me? He does. And this is God's word. That He loves you. That he's interested in everything that happens in your life. And though all may seem wrong today, one day it will all be made right. This morning, here's what you need to know. God has a plan for you. God puts dreams in our hearts. He reveals his will for our lives. We read about it every time we open the Bible. Not everybody's going to be excited about God's will for your life. There may be some jealousy involved. But you stay focused on the Lord. Obey Him. And in the end, God will put you where He wants you. And God will prosper you according to His grace. I want us to stand together this morning. In a moment, we're going to extend an invitation this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, we invite you to come to believe on Him, to receive the free gift of eternal life. He saves. 
those who are lost. So if you're lost, Jesus came to save you. If you'll put your trust and faith in Him, He'll save you. This morning, would you commit your family to the Lord? We're going to do it God's way. We're going to live by God's standards, not the world's, not ours. This morning, by the grace and help of God, we will be a family that honors Him. Father, we thank You for Your love and grace. We pray, Father, as we extend this invitation that Your will will be done in each heart and life. May we be submissive to Your leadership. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah.